for you all. We're going to talk about choices this morning. Now, choices are about options, which are on the surface about engaging your mind in those choices, and in those options, and coming to a decision. Now, we've got to realise that any decision has outcomes, has consequences. And these may be good or not so good or have little consequence at all. Now, when I got up this morning, my biggest uh, choice was what I would wear to the meeting this morning, because it was especially because it was cold. Now, I'd chosen years ago to go to the memorial meeting on a Sunday whenever I could. So to choose to get up this morning wasn't much of a choice at all. But this in itself may be good or bad, whether my mind was really engaged with what I was doing this morning or not, or whether it was just a habit. Back to my choice of apparel. Now these are the kind of choice of incidental uh, options that we all have. Not dictated by values or morals or laws, but simply a preference or maybe a need and of little consequence in the end. Today, many choices are taken out of our hands, even in the society in which we live in, and more so if it was a dictatorship. Generally, they, we are told they are for our good, our safety, or for the good of society as a whole that we live in. This is all based on the premise of what man deems is good good for us and good for society that we live in. There is no guarantee that by accepting the, the choices made by someone else for you will have a good outcome for you. And this is where a line of demarcation uh, emerges. If we don't engage our mind in our choices, we are less likely to buy in to those laws or rules that are placed upon us. And this is where a clash may emerge. Now we know that the large proportion of man's laws don't clash with God's laws. But where they do, we have a choice. We have a decision to make. Because just because man doesn't involve God in their uh, options or their choices, doesn't mean that we have to follow that same pathway. Because a godless choice would inevitably lead to a godless consequence. And I don't have to spell that out to you, do I? Now, in thinking of everyday life, there comes a time when we all have to make life-changing decisions. These may be decisions regarding our study that may lead to, the, to our working life. And that might have consequences for maybe the next 50 years. But along that way, there are usually opportunities to make other choices and change maybe the direction in which we are going and find a more satisfying uh, work in our life. But there is a one-time decision that all our subsequent decisions therefore become based upon where we make one change to the direction in life and that change in the direction of life must continue for the rest of our days. That decision has eternal consequences. It is one that we must engage our mind in all the time. Of course, we are talking about making that decision to follow the path of God. It has eternal consequences by God's grace, very good. We have to decide in that one time to follow man's ways or God's ways and then continue on the designated path that he has laid down. Make a particular entrance to that path and know that by God's grace there is a particular end that we must keep in view whenever we make choices. 
Now, we know that we've all got a free will, so it's our individual choice. But if we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, as he has told us, then when we consider our, our options, hopefully there is one very clear to us. And if we haven't taken it already, the opportunity by God's grace is still there. In Matthew chapter 7, in verses 13 and 14, Jesus spells that very clearly to us. And he gives us the consequences of the options that he sets before us as well. And he said, he advises us to enter through the narrow gate. For he says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. One option. The small is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. The other option. So we have or had a choice of a six lane highway, a life with no boundaries, sounds appealing, but leads to nothing. The narrow lane way with a small gate, with godly parameters, where every step along our way, every decision, every choice we make is always flavoured by God's principles. And that, Jesus says, leads to life. But it's still our choice to make. The great thing about making choices about a godly way is that God promises to help us along that way as we sung to him today. Because we have chosen what God wishes us to do, he says in Isaiah chapter 30, if we wander off the road to the right or to the left, we'll hear a voice behind us saying, here's the road, follow it. Now, those words make me feel very good because it leaves us with the idea that God is very willing to intervene even when we make maybe the wrong choice. And maybe those choices might lead us to the pathway that we've put our feet upon. The thought leaves us still with free will, but it makes me think there's a tap on the shoulder from God in some way to cause us to reconsider the pathway that we maybe are starting to deviate from. Choices. Choices from the human point of view, as John chapter 2 verse 16 say very well. They described, and as I say, in a very human way, and I'll read it out to you from the ISV, which puts it in a slightly different manner. These are three desires that we, read, we sung of in one of our hymns. The desire for freshly gratification, the desire for possessions, and a position of worldly arrogance. And what follows is the most important part about the choice. We're told that these things are not from the Father, but are of the world or of the society in which we live in. Very clear exhortation for us from that. Don't let the craving of godless things or pursuits and the choices we make based upon them, don't let them override the choices we make from a godly point of view. For at the very least, they are empty of anything. At the worst, they lead to an inevitable end. Now, remain, keep those three choices in your mind. Think about Adam and Eve for a moment. They had everything you could think you could want. A life of harmony with God and with the creation around them. As you remember, God set before them a command which left them with a choice to make, to follow his command and heed his word or not. And he also left them with that command with a clear consequence if they disobeyed. Now, 
I don't know how big the garden was, but there was many trees in that garden. They could have just stayed away from that tree, but Eve, probably with Adam, went for a walk and they went for a look. Yes, they went for a look, their eyes. Now we know there was outward suggestion, as we're told in scripture. But the workings of their minds and the considerations they made and the decisions they took and the ultimate consequence that came upon him were all theirs. Harmony with God and the creation was broken. And the sentence of death came upon them as God said it would. All because of a bad choice. That process just follows exactly and it mirrors those words that we read from John. What you see... Sure, it produced good food, and that was a grat freshly gratification. Sure, it looked very good, and in appearance, so she desired to have it. And it was desirable to make one wise, yes, worldly arrogance in being wiser than somebody else. And she made a decision, she made a choice. She took it, she ate of it. We're told that she was deceived, yes. But she thought about it still and she decided. If Adam's advice was sought, it certainly wasn't given. And for Adam, there's no note of the process of his mind, though it was obviously the same. And do you know what his decision was in the end? He chose to be with Eve and not with God. And the consequence was, was as God had said, and they then came to understand what they had done. And soon after they felt the displeasure of God and they were thrust from the garden and from God's presence. Sadly, we like them sometimes don't think of the consequences of our choices. But hopefully if our good, we make good choices and they become a habit because we take God into our considerations. If that is the case, then we won't so easily be deceived as Eve was. If our, if our choices are ruled by the three considerations of the world, we must realise they're all about self not of God and the result will not be of God either as sure as it was not in Eden because we have free will the outcomes of our choices whatever they may be are ours to own and when Christ comes we'll be asked just that God wants us to choose his ways, prompted by love for him that we have. A response from a grateful heart for what he has done through the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise of grace. Let that dictate the choices we make in all our lives. God is faithful in all he has promised. And if we choose to live according to his will and act accordingly, then we know by grace what the outcome will be. The other option, be like Adam and Eve and choose to disregard God. Jesus talks about choices. We'd like to look at Matthew chapter 6, if you would, with me, and verse 25, the beginning. Matthew chapter 6 and firstly verse 25. Jesus says, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, about your body, what you shall put on. It is, not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
Now, he's talking about here what our priorities should be in the choices we make in life. Now, it's too easy to seek the things that we think we need and believe we need in this life that we live now and put God second. But he says in verse 31 to 33, Do not be anxious saying what we shall eat or what we shall drink or what we shall wear. For the Gentiles seek all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be yours as well. First, seek God's kingdom as our choice. And everything that surrounds God's righteousness make that first your choice. And the promise is then that all the things that we, God knows we need and what we might generally seek after in this world, God will give us as he knows what we need and he will fill those needs. So apart from belief, what does it come down to? It comes down to trusting in God's word. He says in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend upon your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. There's your choice. Make it. What set me on the road of talking about choices this morning was when I considered Lot and his choices a little while ago. And I thought it would make a good exhortation for us this morning. And we're just going to go through a few things now of the life of Lot and how he was, his life was bound up initially with Abraham. The first choice that Lot made was a good one because when Abram told him of the promise that God had made to go to Canaan, and he was going to leave, Lot decided he would go with him, so it was a good choice. There was no practical promise made to him. But he believed if he went with Abram, then the outcome would be good to this land of Canaan far away. So he went. He went, he made a choice based upon faith. Would we have made that, fight, that choice? Well, yes. Those of us who are baptised have made that choice as well. We believe in Jesus Christ and we've shown it by being baptised. For Paul in Galatians chapter 3 leaves us in no doubt and tells us that the choice of being baptised into Christ is, makes us heirs to the promises made to Abraham. Lot was blessed with Abraham. He left Haran and they had goods and herds. And it seems that the faith in the God of Abraham was a good choice for Lot. Simply from the immediate outcome that had, that had come upon him. Let alone what the promise was ahead. But in life, as we know, every one of us, there is the inevitable challenge to our faith. A severe drought comes upon them in Canaan, so they go down to Egypt together. Another choice for Lot to make, did he go with Abram or not? Should he go back to Haran where it's well watered with his herds? No, he'll go with Abraham. Would you turn, please, to Luke chapter 9? And I'm going to paraphrase verses 57 and 58 with Lot in mind. Luke chapter 9 Verses 57 and 58. Where Jesus is confronted by people who haven't quite made the decision of what they will do in following Jesus. There's excuses and they're wondering what they will do. Luke 9, 57 and 58, and I'll paraphrase it with Lot. It's like Jesus saying to Lot, You made the choice by leaving the security of your family at home, so what are you waiting for? So, so follow me. Don't get caught up by thinking, is it the right choice? But knowing that it is the 
right choice. Just follow. No buts, no ifs, just do it. Verse 61, follow me. But as with Lot, God and Jesus want our wholehearted response. Not the half-hearted one, will I, won't I. Let our actions mirror our words of saying we will follow Jesus. It should be a clear choice, as Jesus was saying. Follow the master. Verse 62 of that chapter says, Jesus says very, very clearly that no one who puts his hand to the plough and turns back is fit for the kingdom of God. We know the position of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and we're told in Hebrews 12 verse 2 to follow him, to fix our eyes upon him, observe what he did and how the op options in his life, uh, how they worked out for him. It's very clear from Hebrews that, that he looked to the end. He looked past the terrible things that he knew were going to come upon him in his life for the the choice that he made in doing God's will. He was able to endure the shame because he looked for the joy that was set before him. And he despised what all he had to go through but kept his eye fixed on the outcome, the consequence, if you would. It's no different for us. It's no different for Lot. No different for Adam and Eve. Our choices may be t must always be tempted, tempered by our end view. If we're looking forward to the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, then our choice is clear. Let it be uncluttered by the decisions that are easy to make in our everyday life. Try to eliminate the ifs and the buts. And thus make our course a straighter an easy one, we pray, to the kingdom. But Jesus warned us there is no turning back. The decisions to follow must continue unabated till the kingdom comes. Just for a moment, just go back to Lot. If you remember the story, they went down to Egypt and Abram had a bit of a, a few decisions to make and he made, in this instance, the wrong decision. Now, up until this time, Lot had observed his uncle following God's ways, very decisive in the decisions he made. He sees, sees Abram make a choice that went against all the other decisions. You remember Abram feared for his life when God told him he shouldn't, and he chose not to be truthful about Sarai, who his wife. Now, this scenario is one for learning, especially for the younger amongst us, and their view of the older. Advice from an older and wiser head should always be considered when you are making your choices, but it still must be your choice to own when you make it. Bad choices by another person doesn't mean that faith is void. It doesn't mean that their faith is void. It just means that they have made a bad choice. It also doesn't mean that when you observe that person who you may have held highly in your view, that your faith is now questionable. God's truth stands regardless of man's choices and man's decisions. So if you're younger, hold that dear, please. We know that Lot made some very bad decisions when they came back out of Egypt. They came back out of Egypt with herds numerous, both of them. And decision had to be made. They couldn't live one with another closely anymore because there wasn't enough water. Abram says to Lot, you make a choice, whichever way you'll go, I'll go the opposite and we will separate. We know what Lot did. He looked with his eyes 
And he thought, well, I've got large herds. Look down the Wellwater Valley down below. That'd be good for me. I'll be able to have bigger herds. He made his decision to walk away from Abram, to walk away from what had brought him there in the first place, in that promise made to him. But he didn't only make one bad choice, he made more bad choices. So one followed the other. And that is sad, because it doesn't have to be. Twice God intervened in his life to save him, to turn him back. Twice he saved him, once from an invading army and the other time from the destruction of Sodom. But what did Lot do? Instead of climbing up into the hills to where Abram and God were, as was advised by the angel, he didn't. Sadly, he took the other option and didn't go back to where he could have been saved. Brethren, sisters, young people, don't ever think that a bad choice that takes us off in the narrow way doesn't mean that we can't follow it by a good choice and seek redemption. You know the very well known words of God. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and turn to him. Now we come to Jesus. Jesus' options, choices, are in direct contrast to those of Adam and Eve. One was the condemnation, the other to redemption. And those of Lot, he lost sight of the kingdom. We read of Jesus this morning his apparent instant repudiation, repudiation of the thoughts that while in the wilderness. They follow those three things, those three types of choices that were mentioned in John, exactly the same as us. The outcome of his choices was different because he had already made a choice. He had made the choice to do all to his Father's glory. And everything that crossed that path was immediately discounted. Oh, wouldn't it be so good if we made that same choice? His Father's will came first in everything. Truly, this dictated every decision he made. He knew that the decisions he made would bring hatred, rejection, a horrible death. But he could also visualise the ultimate income, outcome of his choice and his decision. The consequences he would bear for the wonderful outcome. And so he did not deviate in any way from the course he had set upon. Our overarching choices should mirror that of Jesus to the best of our ability. With the help of God and trust in him. And let our knowledge and our love of God dictate our choices and therefore the outcomes that we know will flow from them. We say again, the aim of Jesus' life was to know and glorify his heavenly Father and so all his choices were based upon that fact. What does it mean for us? It means that we must place first what God wants for us because we have elected to, to walk down that path and act as his children. Remember, first, seek his kingdom, the kingdom of God. Make that a, our focus and all things by God's grace will follow, even to our daily needs being fulfilled. <coughs> the caveat, of course, is following and seeking God's righteousness. And of course, that is important when we come to a meeting such as this this morning. And that will follow the promise of our daily needs and our eternal needs will follow. All based upon the righteousness of God shown in the life of Jesus Christ. 
which we know and trust. So, all of us, brothers, sisters, young people, everyone here this morning, we have a decision to make. We have choices to make. We seek first the kingdom of God and trust that all things will follow. It is up to us to make a good or a bad choice and God will judge.